Two scientists are traveling far above the Arctic Circle to one of the last areas of land left before the North Pole. They're on their way to the floating ice shelf of Peterman Glacier in Greenland. It's a re very remote location. It's very rarely visited. Probably only a handful of people have ever been there, certainly at this time of year, at the end of the melt season. We're treading where few have trodden before. The only way to get there is by icebreaker or helicopter. And since there are no ships going near Peterman this year, the scientists had to set up remote gas stations along the way a year earlier. But that gas may have already been used by someone else. Helicopters have very short ranges. They can fly only two or three hours on one fuel tank. I'm not entirely sure if we will even get to Peterman because we don't know for sure how much gas is actually there to move us forward. And if we fly high, we consume much less fuel. We can't go back again the following week or anything like that. That would have been the end of it. So there's a big build-up, and then the whole thing has got to go wham-bam in, in sort of, what, 36 hours or something, and it's got to go right. The fuel caches were found full, allowing the team to keep going on their journey. A year ago, when the scientists traveled to Peterman, they carried out a complex operation where a cable attached to five ocean sensors was sent beneath the thick ice, as thick as a football field, to find out how quickly the ice shelf was melting. Nobody else in Greenland has that data. Nobody in Greenland has ever been able to observe what happens in the ocean under a glacier. But about six months later, the data stopped transmitting, and they don't know why. I will be very, very nervous to see if that's actually how much data there is because the station stopped talking to me. The iridium failed on February 11th. That is why we're going up there. Back in 2010, when Peterman Glacier started breaking apart, Mu and Chow didn't think it was related to climate change, even when a chunk of ice four times the size of Manhattan split off. After the first breakup, I was still saying that this is an event that is within the range of natural variability. In 2012, a second breakup happened that was just as big. And OK, this is a second breakup. Now it's another extreme event. So it's two extreme events in six years. So something is happening. And I already see the beginning of a third breakup. And I believe that within the next two or three years, there will be another event like that, which is pushing this glacier even further backwards. The ice shelf has already been reduced by 40%. If it breaks off entirely, Peterman Glacier could begin surging into the ocean and driving significant sea level rise. We're adding to the bucket, and the bucket keeps overflowing. And the overflow is then that a kind of ordinary storm or hurricane, rather than having four feet, that it had 50 years in terms of adding to a surge, now has five feet. I don't see any animals chewing on it. No, no, I think there's no animals here. Mew and Chow and Nichols are about to find out if the cables under the ice shelf are still working, or if their research over the last year has been destroyed. It's going to be really important because it's going to tell us whether these are still recording. Keith, my collaborator from the British Antarctic Survey, he's already bracing me to the fact that might be broken because the glacier moves and the glacier might have pulled the cables apart in the ice. So we might be just attending a burial, confirming that, yes, the ocean component is dead. We're making progress here. So I will be devastated for about um, 15 minutes and then I will be thinking about other ways that one can perhaps get similar data in a more sustainable way. But I still um, cling the to the hope that there's still some life in them. OK, there we go. When I first saw it, I thought that uh, this was a disaster. The AWS was sort of leaning over at a ridiculous angle. That is, as in the automatic weather station. And it looked bad, but then we looked at the cables. Yeah. There's a light. I opened the box, okay. meaning where the oh. computer is, where the data log is. I didn't do much, just pulled the memory card. And I can check the data there because it has voltage, it's being recharged. And then went to the computer. And there's a data file. Well, 27, 4 p.m. Whatever, it's around about now, so, so that's... that's, that's uh, and it was a full data set. It had just collected the last data half an hour ago. 
that is good news. <laughs> and sure, it looked dreadful at the surface, like a wreck, but all that matters is the data from the ocean, 100 meters under the ice, doesn't give a damn how the surface looks, <laughs> as long as the cable is working. <laughs> and it was working. And um, so then, okay, Keith, you were wrong in this one. <laughs> The temperatures on Peterman were nearly freezing. As the sun fell but never set, Nichols and Muenchow worked through the night to rebuild their instruments. I didn't sleep for 33 hours because there was not enough time to do everything that a careful, conscientious scientist would like to do. And since the clock is ticking, clock meaning the helicopter is standing by, that's where the intensity comes in. After almost 30 hours, their work on the glacier was complete. The scientists flew off, hopeful that this time their data would keep transmitting for a year, maybe two, maybe more. What matters is the data coming through. And every three hours for the last two days since we left Peterman, there has been an upload of clean, nice data as scheduled, and that's, that's I mean, pretty awesome. It's also important to understand what it is that we're living in, to know better how we're changing the planet that we're living on. And it's a small, it's a small contribution.